Welcome to the Wayne Public Library's virtual author chat. My guest today is Terry Brisbane. RWA RITA nominated award-winning USA Today best-selling author Terry Brisbane is a mom, a wife, a grandmom, and a dental hygienist from Southern New Jersey. Terry has sold more than 3 million copies of her 50 plus historical and paranormal romance novels and novellas in more than 25 countries and 20 languages around the world. Her current and upcoming historical and paranormal fantasy romances will be published by Harlequin Historicals, Dragon Blade Publishing, Oliver Heber Books, and independently too. Welcome, Terry. Please tell us a little more about yourself and your new novel, The Lady Takes It All. Hi, and thanks for having me here. Um, I sound very busy on that bio. <laughs> um, right now, I've been concentrating mostly on writing. Uh, but I did start, as you mentioned, The Lady Takes It All is my newest book, um, and it is the first book in a series I'm writing for Dragonblade Press. Uh, they are a publisher of historical romances, and they do historical mysteries, just historicals, some paranormal or time travel historicals, but everything is historical. And this series actually is a really big change for me, and I think we may have talked a little bit about it last time because I think I may have been been working on the first book, this first book, um, it is set in Regency Scotland rather than medieval Scotland. So uh, it's about five centuries later. Um, and although most readers and of course TV watchers are very familiar with Regency England, either between Jane Austen and of course the Bridgerton series, not a whole lot of people are familiar with Regency Edinburgh. And Edinburgh was, well, the Scots were always considered barbarians to the English, but in actuality, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, um, Edinburgh was considered the Athens of the North because of the revival um, in education and industry and philosophy and medical studies and even police reform. And it kind of comes as a surprise to a lot of people. So when I was asked to write Regency Scotland. I was really excited um, to go back and do that. Did you did you do a lot of research on that time period? It's, it's, it is different from the medieval. Oh, it's really different. And um, and again, because lots of people read Regencies, they think they know the the history. But Scotland, even at that time, even though they had joined the crowns. A uh, century before, Scotland was still its own country, um, and it had its own rules, and everything you think you know about the Regency time period isn't correct for Scotland, so it required a lot of research. Um, now, I was lucky because about 15 years ago, I did write three Regencies um, historicals for Harlequin, and one of them was set in, in Regency Edinburgh. So I had kind of start the, a good start to the research. Um, but then of course, as the characters kind of came into play, I was researching more facets of Edinburgh at the time. Um, you know, every little kind of trope thing that you use in a Regency set in England, um, the runaway bride, the, you know, marriage of convenience, they're forced to marry. It doesn't work in Scotland because Scotland is where they all ran. So yeah. in Scotland, for example, all you had to do was say you were married to each other in front of witnesses and you were married. And so it was a whole different scenario. So it required a lot of research, um, which really didn't break my heart at all. Um, and I have acquired a bigger library now, but the best part about researching is I happened to be planning my trip to Scotland before I wrote these books. And of course it was postponed, but I did get to Scotland in September just last year. So I had written most of the first book, but I was still working on it. And so I had a chance to visit the streets and most of Regency Edinburgh still exists. It's, you know, it's still, you can go into buildings that are still retain their design, their history. And so you can walk the streets where your characters would have walked and 
it feels like you're there. So that kind of um, in-person research was great too. Can't do that with medieval quite as much, except mm -hmm. for a few castles. <laughs> No, I mean, it, I, I read a lot of Regency romances um, over the years. And is it Gretna Green? Is that the yes. place that everybody would run off to? to get? Well, Gretna Green was the first village over the border on the Great North Road. But that's out to the west. There were several versions of that that would have been a straight run from York. And but it was it didn't matter if it was a big village or not. As soon as you crossed the border, if you spoke your intention in front of witnesses, you were married. And there was actually a way to like, uh, and they use the word regular, to have a regular, you could file a report with the local sheriff, the count, the shire sheriff, and it would become, a you know, all the paperwork was done. But Gretna Green, they did it for you. So that's why it's known. <laughs> Famous one. Yes. Um, and is there something you want to tell us about The Lady Takes It All that isn't in the blurb? Well, if you've read or seen any of my social media, this isn't a really big secret, but this series for Dragonblade is called The Unexpected Heirs of Scotland. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I decided that it needed to be about my celebrity crushes. Okay. So I chose people, men, I adore, uh, or adored, and I decided to base my heroes on those celebrity crushes. So this first book, when I was starting with the ideas and kicking around some things, um, I saw a story about a minor diplomat from Scotland in the late 1700s, a young man who was actually the first um, from Europe to visit and find and discover um, a buried Roman city in the Algerian desert. And um, he, he um, excavated some of it, they charted it, they, you know, drew it, and he was acclaimed as the discoverer of this city. And so when I started playing with that idea of how to use it, my celebrity crush kind of came into play. And that is Josh Gates, from Expedition Unknown and various shows on the Discovery Channel. And so Joshua Robertson is a thinly disguised Josh Gates. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun with that. Um, I enjoy his personality. I've, I've seen him in person. He does some shows where he talks and he just has this really love of history, but he's very fun and funny and self-deprecating. And so I thought this is the perfect guy for this, um, this story. So um, the next book is um, my crush was, are you a general hospital gal? Back in the day. <laughs> okay. Duke Lavery was my okay. first Scotsman. And so the second book is based on Duke Lavery as portrayed by Ian Buchanan. So I've been having a lot of fun with him because he is morally questionable. He's in it for himself. So I'm having a lot of fun with that. But Lady Takes It All, I really had a, a good time using a lot of things I've seen and heard from the actual Josh Gates. And uh, yeah, so that was fun. And so you're saying that it was a real person who discovered in the Algerian desert? Found yes, there was a, a Roman, a town built by the uh, Roman emperor. Uh, now I can't place it, Trajan, Trajan. And so this, this city had been covered for centuries and he was there exploring and he found these ruins starting to become uncovered. And so I kind of used that. The actual explorer went on to trace the Nile to its source. And he wrote a very long um, de description of it, published books. And people thought that he was making it up. So he was actually discredited in history um, until someone traced the route that he took and found everything exactly as he described it. Um, however, that wasn't until after he died. So he never really got his reputation back. And I kind of used that kind of play on reputation in this story. So 
and um, you mentioned your inspiration. Now, how do you choose like character names? Um, well, I shamelessly used Joshua as the first. I was going to do a play on his name and hyphenate it, but I just used Joshua for the first name. And then I had to come up with um, he and the, the thing that saves my character, uh, because there are questions raised about his journeys and his exploits, is that he inherits a title. And um, in that time period, if you had a title, if you were noble, you avoided a lot of the lesser um, uh, crimes, you could not be charged with certain things, you could not be put in jail. And so a title really covered a lot of sins. And so um, when I started looking, I really, I look at the list, I have a book on Scottish peerage, which is all the noble levels and names and properties. And it turns out in Scotland, it does not work the same way either as it does in England. So <laughs> nothing works the same. So I basically looked for an area that I wanted to set the story and kind of made up a name and made up a title and, and went with that. But it still works that the daughter would not have inherited. So like- the Correct. So well, in this case, fail. he in this case he inherits from a distant cousin, so there are no other um, uh, male relatives or anybody else to inherit. And again, Scottish inheritance did not preclude a woman from inheriting. Depended on how it was all written down, but yeah, lots of things that you think you <laughs> don't work that way in Scotland. <laughs> So uh, my uh, question of like, what did you learn in crafting this book? <laughs> but it's, obviously you learned a lot of the different Yes, yes. And I, I worked with an editor who has, I think, her PhD in English history, 19th century English history, which is Regency. Um, but her exposure to Scottish history was not as as strong. And so we had a lot of back and forth about... It works that way in England, but that's not how they do it in Scotland. I kind of have that banner written, you know, um, because it didn't. I mean, marriage laws were different. Property laws were different. Titles, for example, if you inherited, you became a, say, an earl in Scotland. That didn't mean you went to Parliament, even though it was the United Kingdom. In Scotland, if you inherited a title, you actually had to have a whole nother invitation to be invited to be seated in Parliament. And that was how the English made sure there weren't too many Scots controlling the House of Lords. Yeah, so um, interesting stuff. And you can tell I get very excited by it. I, I you know, I love it. I love finding out. Well, it's great to like read a historical that's going to give you a different take because I mean it is the Regency and the Regency period was very short in yes. terms of the history. Um, so to read well this is this is the UK but it's not the same. So that's, that's yeah. always you learn a whole new area. Well as yeah. you're saying even your editor was learning a whole new yeah, uh, and I have to keep all my source material because even the universities didn't work the same way. And my my third hero is a university professor, and we've already had some back and forth because it's not the way they did it in Cambridge or Oxford. And I have to keep saying, no, it's not. <laughs> so interesting. I think it's interesting. Um, so some of my questions were about writing. I don't know if you wanted to go into like your, do you have a writing routine? Uh, <laughs> like, do you wake up at early or do you go to bed late and write? You know, what's the best uh, formula for you for being creative and getting your ideas down on the page? A deadline makes me creative. Um, I, my writing style, uh, not my writing style, my writing process has really changed over the last, say, four or five years. Um, and I used to be reliably a procrastinator and I could write, it would take me about four to six months to write the first half of the book. And it would take me the last two to three weeks of deadline to write the second half. Um, but then 
life changed, things changed. And, you know, I finally find myself kind of getting back to almost that process. I had a few books that were really painfully slow, page by page. Um, and it had me doubting myself. But I feel like the process is back. I do. I have been writing most of it at the towards the end of the deadline. I'm a night person. But I used to write exclusively at night, but that's changed. Um, so now it's kind of I um, when I'm on deadline, I write and I try to get like right now I, I with the other um, people that are in the chat room right now are some of my writing friends. And we have a term called writing adjacent. So if I'm not writing, I'm doing writing adjacent tasks, which, of course, the research the drafting the characters trying to get the characters lined up and ready to go and ready then to take off on their own and do everything i told them not to um so so i just try to write as much as i can and um and and it's i'm taking one book at a time at this point and how long on average you mentioned you know four six months but like how long on average does it take you to um write a book yeah, and I, I know the rest of it is going to take oh. off the publishing part of it. Like, but how long the actual writing? Um, actual writing, I have to give myself four to six months. I I don't write well at the beginning, and I can't predict the how long you know now with the ending. So I still like to have four to six months. And of course, when you're writing on that kind of schedule with a multi book contract you're not just writing one book. Like right now I'm working on the third book of the series because the second book is turned in, but I'm waiting for revisions and edits after that. So as I'm trying to write new, I constantly have to stop and go work on the other project and then come back. So it's, I don't usually write only one thing at a time. I'm usually multi-projects because I have a number of books, you know, due. But I like six months. I'm trying it a little faster. Um, not comfortable, but we'll see. We'll see. Is it the, the four to six months? Do, like if it's for Harlequin or if it's for Dragon Blade or even if it's your independently published. So like you try and hold to that same even regardless of if it's for the publisher or for the independently published. Well, it depends. A lot of my independent projects that I've done have been novella or shorter lengths, anything up to uh, anything between 20 and 50,000 words. Um, and so those are usually involved in a project, like I've done some multi-author projects and we've contributed. And that usually doesn't take as long. But when I get to this the same length, I write about 70 to 75,000 for Harlequin and around 75 to 78,000 for Dragonblade, I do find I need that. Um, so I try to get that four to six, well, actually five to six months in the contract for it. Um, and then lately, if something happens, like last book, I got COVID when I was supposed to be doing my big push. And that threw me off for weeks and weeks. So there always has to be some flexibility in that. Um, but I'm aiming for writing time five to six months for a full length project. Okay. And so what... Well, my question is, what does literary success look like to you? <laughs> uh, literary success. Um, I'm getting my books published. I'm getting out there to readers. I've got publishers who want my books and who want to publish my work. And I'm making some money. And that's really, that's really what success is um, for me. Yeah. And what do you think makes a good story? Uh, um, the stories I like to read are, there's an emotional investment in the characters. Um, I, I don't have to like the characters in order to call it a good story, but I have to see that the characters have a potential, a potential to grow and change. And of course, in a romance, we know that the love relationship is going to do that. And so I think a good story has characters that can emotionally connect to readers and make them feel something. And again, at the beginning, it might be hatred or whatever, but the worst worst kind of story is when you just don't care about the characters you know they could shrivel up and die and it wouldn't bother you 
that's not to me, that's not a good story. And of course, there's lots of layers. It's not just the characters. It's, you know, this is a big discussion on author's loops about historical accuracy. And um, people get very upset at stories or when you watch something like Bridgerton on TV because it's not accurate. Well, I write fiction. So my feeling is, I can do anything I want as long as I respect the reader and respect the story I'm trying to tell. And so I tr I think a good story makes it feel authentic to you. Doesn't have to be accurate. Most readers don't care when the you know when a battle takes place or when something happened. They care about the feeling of the story. And so that to me is a is a good story that the reader feels an authentic mood or time and place and connects to the characters. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just I it's taken me a lot of time because I would never not finish a book. Never. When I was, I hate to say, just a reader, before I started writing to be published, I would never not finish a book. And I didn't care if I didn't like it. I didn't care if it was boring. I didn't care. I read the whole thing. I don't do that anymore um, because I don't have time. And if a story is boring me or if I'm not connecting and I don't care, the book is gone. And that happened last week and it surprised me. Um, but it's like, no, I don't have time to not care about this. <laughs> so um, that's what I, I really strive for in my writing is I want you to care about them. <laughs> even, even, my, even my morally questionable hero that's coming up. You're going to either like him or hate him, but you're going to want to know what happens. And that's, I think, the critical part. That is very important. Yeah. I read, <laughs> as, as I mentioned to you earlier, I read, you know, for two book discussion groups. And if you're just like, oh, my goodness, I do not care what happens to these people. <laughs> I mean, although that lends itself to really good discussions. <laughs> we have very good discussions if we don't like the book. Um, yes. But half the time, if you got half and half, you're going to get a very interesting perspective and uh, you might be swayed to reconsider your opinion about them. <laughs> but, and I've, I've also found um, there are some books I've read and this has been over the last few years with being on lockdown. I really didn't do well with the anxiety of it. And I found reading was not my comfort anymore. And so there were books that I felt like I don't like this book. I just am not getting into this book. And I put them aside. And I have found that reading some books at a different time in life, or depending on the circumstances around you, I do find that if I give some books a second chance, I have a much different reaction to them. So I, I am willing to do that if there was something that caught me on the story. Yes, uh, that actually is, is, is a really hot topic we've had in our discussion, <laughs> it's, um, reading books at different times in your life. and. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you with the COVID during lockdown, um, reading was not. And I I had to, st I still did virtual book groups and it was not easy. And I think we were all in a consensus of this is not, like we don't feel the same about reading. And we, yeah. yeah. But and, luckily- and, that's, and that surprised me because reading is my comfort. I mean, no matter what I'm doing in life, whenever I have a book, well, I would have a paperback, but now I've got a Kindle, but I've got a book in my car. I used to have one, I called it, you know, it was the practice book because I had three boys in different sports programs and driving all over and sitting. I always had a book or two stuffed in the pockets of the car because I just never knew. And so it surprised me when I couldn't read and that was really shocking. So I'm glad I am back to reading. <laughs> yes, yes. I think a lot of folks were in that position and now have gotten past it, luckily, thankfully. Yeah. Um, do you ever read, oh, we have, a, we have a comment. I was opposite oh. during COVID and read more than usual because I couldn't write and needed diversion. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and, that's, and that's, that's pretty much what I've seen. People were either um, very depressed or very anxious and everybody dealt with it like almost the opposite of, you know, the introverts that didn't want to be out had a great time 
<laughs> being able to stay in and not and, and avoid things where the inter extroverts were, you know, feeling the strain of uh, of the lockdown. So yeah. Um, one of the questions was, um, do you read your book reviews and how do you deal with good ones or bad ones? <laughs> Well, I'm sure I never get a bad review. I'm, I'm positive. <laughs> um, I do read them. I do. Um, I think it's interesting how many readers get what you're trying to do and other readers don't. And so it's always, I'm always curious to see whether if I've tried something with a character or tried a different story, how it goes over. Um, it's ne good ones and bad ones are never easy to read. They're just not. Um, but I have learned that the point is it's a reader's opinion. They're entitled to it and never engage, never engage. Even if, even if they have something factually incorrect, you can't engage. Um, there are certain communities of reviewers that are absolutely horrific if you engage <laughs> and so never going to do that the only time i've ever actually tried to correct something when something was actually wrong uh, it was a big thing about the character um the blog the review was on a blog and i contacted the blog owner and just said this is incorrect and she put a little disclaimer in and that was fine but it was like if it's your opinion you're entitled to it I, I did, did laugh. I still remember one. I did a time travel story to Elizabethan England. So it was called The Queen's Man. And it turns out that the hero is the rightful king of England. He was Henry and Anne's son who did survive. It's a time travel. It's an alternate history. And someone took me to task over the description of one of the um, outfits that the queen wore. And they assured me that the queen never had a dress in that color. And that if I had done 20 minutes of research, I would have discovered the queen never had that cover. Did she? I don't know, but it worked. <laughs> but this person was clearly very upset with me. And I just well, didn't the time travel element didn't bother them at all. We are taking someone from the present and throwing them 400 years into the past. That's okay. But the queen did not have that color dress. So I always thought that was the funny kind of the funniest one I had the reaction to. That is a very amazing. <laughs> yeah. Now I do have one, this, I have one for the lady takes it all, which I'm sure the person, the reader didn't mean it as a compliment, but I took it as a compliment because it talks about how sexy the book was. Oh. <laughs> and they were complaining that there was sex out of marriage and that there were at least five different love scenes. And to me, yay. <laughs> And so I used it as a positive. <laughs> I would do. Oh my yeah, God, the reviews, well. it, it's tough. You know, there are a lot of people I know, a lot of writer friends who will not look at theirs. And that's okay. But I'm kind of the personality that if someone is talking about me or knows something about me and I don't know it, it drives me crazy. So I have to go and find out. And then I just walk away. <laughs> oh. Do you hear from your readers? I mean, not not the ones that are posting. <laughs> do you hear from your real, like the readers who, uh, you know, want to engage in a positive way? <laughs> I do. I do. I get a number of emails from readers every month. Um, right now, people are upset with me because I did a fantasy series a couple of years back. And I wrote the first three. And it's a four book connected series. And is in fantasy, you know, the third book was the end of the world as we know it. The publisher shut down. <laughs> so the final book has not been written. And so readers are, I, I get, that's probably consistently the one email I get. Um, but it's good news because I'm writing that book next. So we'll get back to that. But I get lovely, lovely messages from people who say that, you know, they've read my books when 
they were having problems or waiting in a hospital or, you know, and it's kind of the things that just, it, it, it makes you feel very special that you're able to give someone comfort, uh, a, a time out of reality that they can just, you know, enjoy and relax in the middle of stress. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. And uh, yeah. Do you have any one particular um, memorable reader encounter that you want to share? Um, the one that happened at a book signing. Um, and I'm trying to remember if it was, I want to say it was a bookstore. And this reader came up and I think I had written maybe about 30 or 32 books at the time. And so I'd written for... I think four publishers by that point. And this person came up to me at a bookstore and started talking to me about a particular couple in a book as though they were real. I mean, I think they're real, but you know, uh, she knew everything about them. And she was very concerned because after the story was done, was I going to have them come back and visit? Was, and she knew everything about them. And I just thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> somebody is paying that much attention to to my work to my characters and I think that was the moment I really felt like I was an author I had a funny experience I had gone to England gosh not too long after my first few books and I went to a meeting and actually spoke to a meeting of the Romance Novelists Association in London um, and I met up with groups and there was an author who is from America, but was living long-term in England. And I met her and she was lovely and we chatted and I saw, I bought her book. She bought my book. We, we stayed in touch. Um, years later, I'm in DC at a dental conference in my other life. And I'm standing in the longest line for Starbucks and friends of mine from the dental group are saying oh Terry do you have a new book out what are you doing next you know what's going on and this couple behind me says excuse me you're not and then they look at my they saw my name tag they said you're the Terry Brisbane and I was like oh maybe I, oh and they were like you write romance novels well now all my dental friends are perking up like oh maybe she writes something worth like and this couple starts talking about how they heard all about my books here it was that author's parents who live in the happened to be in that hotel in DC at the in the line it was just but it was really great to see my dental colleagues reaction to my romance life and so it was kind of cute that is a great encounter though. yeah the whole world the parents of <laughs> the pair uh, yes yes it was just I couldn't I just couldn't believe it I couldn't believe wow it. that is a great story yeah. <laughs> I'm going to uh open up the chat and see if anybody has any questions for Terry. Oh. Um, I had all of my questions. We, we, we actually went through all of the questions. Oh my goodness. We did. Uh, and uh, if there's any other questions anybody has, um, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you working? So we, we'll keep it flowing. Well, what are you working on? You said you're working on book three. So book two is off to the publisher. Um, yes. Book three and then book four. The next book after that you just mentioned is um, part of this fantasy. travel fantasy, fantasy series. Fantasy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've just finished book two, which is called A Lady's Agreement. Um, and it's a twist on, you know, a gentleman's agreement. Um, and uh, the hero is this relentless businessman who always gets what he wants. Um, and maybe people aren't left standing, but he succeeds. And he's quite happy at that. He's just gotten knighted by the king for services rendered and he runs into the immovable force um a woman who holds property that he wants and um he's never met anybody who said no to him and so it's really sparks fly it was a lot of fun to write um i love those kinds of characters because he is dark he is dangerous and you just know because it's a romance you know he is going to get his comeuppance and he is going to fall hard and so i just laughed writing this this book um 
until I could get to the end and make and crush him. It was great. Um, so a ladies' agreement comes out May tenth. Oh, so a yes, uh, from oh. uh, that's the Duke Lavery um, um, okay. hero. The third book is um, a, the Ladies' Tutor, which is a twist on um, My Fair Lady. And the college or university professor is brought in by a, um, a woman, a, a, an earl, to, he's made a deal with his daughter to prove that she doesn't know as much as she thinks she does. And a marriage is at stake. He wants her to marry this really ridiculous man. And she's held him off. And now this, this, this you know, challenge has happened. And the university professor is supposed to prove how witless she is. Um, and of course, as it turns out, she's just wonderful. Um, but then he gets a title, he inherits. And it turns out that she's the one that has to teach him because he's not been in society and he doesn't know the correct behaviors. And so she has to teach him. Um, so that's, that's the third book. And then after that, I'll be writing the fourth and final book of the Warriors of the Stone Circles, which is a really fantasy series. I've, I've just learned a term. It's called romanticy. Um, apparently that's the hashtag romanticy, um, very popular right now. But this, this is a series based on ancient Celtic mythology. The first book was Rising Fire, Raging Sea, Blazing Earth. And the fourth book is Searing Moon. Um, and um, each of the characters, the heroes and heroines, are descendants of ancient Celtic gods and have their power to save humanity. But as I mentioned, by book three, the end of book three, it's the end of the world as we know it, unless they can come back and defeat evil. And um, so book four will be that final conflict. Um, and dragons are involved. That's, I'm so excited about dragons being involved. Um, so that should be out next, about a year from now, um, in March, I believe March or April of 24 is scheduled for release. So a busy writing time. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, we did get a few questions. So oh, good. Do you have a favorite book you've written, or is it the one you are writing or waiting to write? So oh, which I have a couple of favorites for different reasons, and they're usually the ones that made me cry the most when I wrote them. Um, Taming the Highlander was the first one. That's the first book in my McClary series of Harlequin. Um, His Enemy's Daughter. I oh I still sob when I read the end of it. That was a medieval England based on the Norman invasion. And it's really a beauty and the beast story. And he's the beast. And oh, I loved it. And the newest one, or the most recent, I would say, was the Highlander's Runaway Bride. And that just tore my heart apart as I wrote it. Um, there's a there's a picture floating around the internet on my Facebook page. I was crying so much as I read it, I wrote it, that I had stuffed tissues all down my pajama top and under my glasses to try to catch the tear. I was just sobbing as I wrote the, the real, the black moment and then the climax of that book. So it remains wow. kind of my favorite. Yeah. Okay. Now, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to read the next, the next one. Is, sure. Um, when you read, do you only read historical novels? Um, I would say that 95% of my reading for pleasure are historical romances. The other five are a mix of contemporary and paranormal and whatever. Uh, of course, I do a lot of reading for nonfiction, for research. Um, but yeah, I read, I really like the, the bigger escape of a historical romance. Um, when I read contemporary, it could happen. Like it could be, <laughs> and it's not far enough removed for me to give me the real enjoyment. Um, and, and honestly, I pretty much only read contemporary romances by friends okay. um, because I just, uh, I just, I don't want to waste my, write, my reading time. Um, so I'd say 95% are historicals. Do you have any favorite authors? 
I am just head over heels for Minerva Spencer. Um, she writes under three different names. Um, her first books out with Kensington were Barbarous, Dangerous, and Scandalous. I'm telling you, old school, historical, lush writing, wonderful characters. Um, I just love them. Then I found out that she also writes as under a different pen name, she was writing, um, it's called Victorian Decadence. This is steam the wallpaper off the walls, historical erotic romance. Um, it's, well, it's just, you just have to have a cold drink and a fan because it's the steamiest and they're romances. Um, and then under, um, I guess under the same name, she writes historicals that are very sexy, sexy. So she has different pen names for different ones. And I just love her work. Um, and another is Kerrigan Byrne, her historicals. Her Highlanders talk about writing dark heroes. Her, um, uh, and of course, I've just forgotten the name of her. His, the Victorian, I, not rebels. I'll have to, but anyway, Curry and Burn. Ah, oh, what she does with a with a Highlander. Oh, yes, and those are probably the two newer. My my classics are, you know, Madeline Hunter. Um, I read anything. Um, I was, you know. Yeah, I just historical people. Okay. Um, uh, do you have a favorite character that you've written? Oh, I do. <laughs> um, his name is Rorick Eringisselson. He appeared in Taming the Highlander. He was completely unexpected. I did not plan him. He walked into the scene, stole the scene, stole the heroine, and just, I have loved him ever since. And um, he's shown up now. We saw him in the first three books of the series. Then it's like a second generation. And so his story continues and he appears in several other books. And he just appeared in a crossover book I did for Harlequin that connected my two biggest series. And he was part of it. He, I described him as um, a man who loves women. Um, it didn't matter their, their, their size, their age, other than consenting adult, um, uh, whatever background they were from, he loved women and women loved him. And so uh, he just, like I said, walked into my story. And the hero is just not even sure that the heroine isn't in love with him. So just loved him. I think he's been in nine books so far. Yeah. But he's the hero. And he's like the hero of his story is called Surrender to the Highlander. And uh, the funny thing with that, you know, we have this go round about titles. Um, the author in a traditional publisher, the author doesn't usually have final say unless you are a big name author or it's in your contract. And with Harlequin, they have very, they have very specific titling things. And so Taming the Highlander was first and Possessed by the Highlander was second. So when we got to his book, he is half Highlander, half Norwegian, Norse. Um, and I wanted to call it Tempting the Viking. And they said, no, 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 this is after the Viking Age. So they called it Surrender to the Highlander, even though he's not a Highlander, she's not a Highlander. It doesn't happen in the Highlands and there's no surrender, but, the, but it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was oh he was he, oh I loved his story surrender to the Highlander yeah yeah okay well that was the questions that were in the chat so. oh okay <laughs> um, okay if there are no other questions then anybody I'm, else anybody <laughs> else yes <laughs> um then I am gonna say thank you so much Terry this was really fun yeah, I good to see you. Stuff about Scotland and during the Regency period. Um, 
great to like that's always fun to learn a, a little bit more of history um <laughs> and i wish the best of luck with your um forthcoming release uh in may um the next one in this in this series and with um the next couple of books that you mentioned <laughs> oh, um thank you again for joining us thank you everybody who um came on and, and joined us um for the chat um and we'll see you soon <laughs> yes thank you and the wayne library for doing these author events it's really great to get out there to the to the public